What are your thoughts in this area of financials? Yeah, you only have maybe what, 10, 15 dollars in your bank. Yeah, and I think that was a, a low point. Uh. Mm. It, it's just tough, uh, and I think just have to be very scrappy. What are you doing? Why are you not doing stuff today, you know? Are you just reading today? Hey friends, welcome to the Creator in Progress podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Lim. Each episode will bring you inspiring stories and practical advice from both successful and budding creators and entrepreneurs on how they got to where they are today. Ralph is a dog physiotherapist. Yeah, you heard me right. Dogs have physiotherapists too. Ralph and I don't only share a common love for dogs, we both also spent a decade in the corporate world, in the realm of human resources. It's just tough, uh, and I think just have to be very scrappy. Uh, but you know, of course, things didn't work out, so you know, I'm now stuck in a position whereby we either make it or break it. It was something that I wanted to do so far back. Now I just feel that, okay, you know what, if I'm going to do it, I, I have to do it right, and I'm going to do it well as well. You can have all the kind of... Um, qualities you know to be successful uh, but at the end of the day if you lack the courage then I think then you won't go far. Whether you love doggos or not I guarantee you'll take something away. Enjoy the conversation. This episode is co-produced by Skate. Thanks Ralph for being here. Mm. I think um, this is a question I always ask my guests because I always believe it's very important to understand who you are as a person and to do that we need to kind of look back, right, and, and and understand what sort of things shaped you as a person. So I guess, yeah, to understand more about your journey, how do you believe your experiences in uh, your early years have influenced your current path and fueled your passion for what you currently do? Right. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for having me here. Uh, very, very privileged to share my story. And hopefully this has, uh, you know, uh, maybe enabled or, you know, inspired some other person to also do the same. So thank you for the platform. Uh, my, my story has been actually quite a simple one. Uh, was always from a working class family. Don't really have much of, uh, say, uh, I would say things going on in my life. I think it's been quite normal. Uh, you know, nothing really too traumatic to begin with also. Uh, but I think I just knew at a very early age uh, I had a different interest than most other people. Uh, people like to play football, people like to play soccer. I had other different interests. Uh, so I think from that point on, I think, of course, uh, with the different interests, you you kind of click with different set of people and then you kind of, you know, just uh, were in, in a community where people are a little bit uh, more accepting of who you are. So in that case, uh, it allowed me to be uh, in a safe space to kind of explore my own interests without being judged. Mm. So that allowed me to also then basically take up things, um, uh, you know, that, that were not really typical of most people our age uh, and, and to, to really just uh, thrive and uh, flourish in those areas. And I, I suppose that that also helps because uh, the parents weren't too, too critical of what I wanted to do. They were supportive, not in the sense whereby they were there all the time trying to uh, say, nope, you can't do this, you can't do that. But... Uh, and they're not really there for most of the, you know, the the, the major happenings, mm. but uh, but you know they funded the process. Mm. So so I think uh, you know if, if one could ask for more, it's, it would be nice to have them there. But you know, but but that still helps anyway. Mm. Uh, so so yeah. So I think that the process of being allowed to explore without any kind of uh, hindrance, uh, you know, uh, and, and you know being able to have a community that accepts you for who you are in terms of what you want to do, whether how atypical it is. Uh, I think that that was really how it kind of shaped me to then uh, do what I wanted to do today without, you know, having that kind of like baggage or like, you know, that kind of fear mm. and having all the absolute courage to do what I wanted to do. Mm. So you mentioned your other interests. So the mm. other interest was dogs and like cats, yeah. I mean, animals in general. Right. So dogs uh, were one of them. Uh, so dogs, were, of course, uh, you know, how we came to be was... Uh, I mean, of course, that's something we can discuss. But I mean, dogs were, were obviously of, of interest when we were very young. Uh, I didn't see quite as a career, but just wanted to do something with them. Because if you think about, think, let's say, 10, 15 years ago, um, what, what we were doing now wasn't really an industry back then. Mm -hmm. We typically had only, say, dog trainers, even daycares and all the other para-professional type of uh, a work was not made available. Mm. Uh, so, you know, so that's how do you then creatively do something that could impact the, the work of, of you know, uh, the industry and, and elevate the whole, uh, the scene altogether. Mm. And I think this was, of course, propagated by then, you know, the take up of more uh, dogs and cats by younger people of our generation. Mm. Uh, so then that helped also spur and accelerated that kind of, uh, I would say, desire for me to kind of, you know, uh, start that process early on. Mm. So you are a dog physiotherapist, right? Did you ever consider becoming a vet before that? Like, what was mm. um, your process of, like, thinking through that? How did you eventually think, okay, I want to become a dog? 
physiotherapist. Right. So, uh, I mean, vet- being a veterinarian was pretty much not on my mind at that point in time. Mm. Uh, I think I was pretty much studying actually towards doing a, a role in human resources in business. Uh, never came across, you know, to do a science-based kind of project, uh, a science-based profession. Mm. For many reasons, first and foremost, I wasn't really good in science and math to begin with. Mm. Uh, so that naturally ruled out a lot of pathways to, you know, to, to vet school, mm. right? Uh, secondly, finances were a concern. I mean, you know, understandably at a point in time where college was uh, so, so-called, like when, when I was uh, due to enroll in college, uh, it was mostly, I think, very expensive. I think the exchange rate to uh, to study in Australia was like one point three mm. to one. So you know everything was almost thirty percent more expensive, yeah. uh, say compared to say today. Uh, and and yeah, and I think uh, so. All these eliminated my mm. options. So um, so it didn't really occur to me. But I think at some point, you know, uh, you just wanted to kind of revisit that and just say that hey, you know, if you know, I could kind of do something that I've not done before. No, I might as well just go out all the way and do it, lah. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and and you know, even if it means going back down to you know square one, humbling yourself mm-hmm. down, and uh, but but I think you know, if you have other skill sets to make up for it, I think hopefully it should help. Mm. So that's why I came to the point whereby maybe you know I should just try it anyway. Mm, okay, okay, interesting. You know, I wanted to be a vet also. Oh, okay, that's interesting. So, so what stopped you? Um, I w- so I I went to Perth Murdoch mm-hmm. to study also, right? Um, so I went on a foundation mm. course. I went after secondary school. Yeah. Um, I was like, yeah, I want to be a vet and all that. And mm. then they had like this, be a vet uh, for a day, kind of like, mm. you know, you visit the mm. school and check out stuff. Then you had to like flip sheep and yeah. like shave them. You brought it to a museum and all mm. that. I didn't dare to flip the sheep. Okay. <laughs> I was just like, uh, my friend was like, oh. I was like, oh, okay. Um, and then um, then I realized at one point, and I have very bad sinuses, very bad mm. sinuses around like my dogs and all that, right? Mm. So it was very like, um, it's very tough for me to to, to get over that barrier. Lah. Um, with my dogs now, at least they're hypoallergenic. So it's right. really not as bad. Um, but my nose is was just very sensitive. I'm like, oh, then if I have to do this at work every day, it's just very painful in right. that sense. Um, and then also I discovered the distinction between I love animals versus I want to cut animals up and like help them. Like, I think that was kind of like that difference where I was like, Maybe vet science is not for me. Right. Uh, I mean, I mean, first and foremost, Murdoch has a very good vet school. Uh, in fact, most most veterinarians in, Singap- in Singapore most likely are from there anyway. Mm. I know of a few people who come from there. Uh, but but yeah, like I say, I think we have to be very sure about, you know, you, you have a passion in animals, but the thing is, you know, doing it as a career, you know, may make you become jaded, mm. right? So it becomes a point when you, you know, become so fatigued, you know, uh, they call it compassion fatigue. Uh, then, you know, you, de- you detest your job at mm. some point, then, you know, then you basically eliminate yourself of a potential opportunity to help dogs in other ways. Mm. So, so I think, you know, yeah, you have to be very clear with what you want. And I think, you know, like I say, you are still making hit waves in other areas. And I don't think that's actually uh, far less of a, a contribution anyway. You know, I think we are doing things in different areas to help elevate the, the industry and like what we're doing today. Hopefully, if we can inspire the next generation of people to, you know, take up and, you know, uh, be be more uh, acutely aware of the options out there to you know help the dogs. I think yeah, I think we have made a uh, hit waves. I think and we are really successful that way. Mm, I agree. I agree. I I think yeah, like I I didn't really hear of like physiotherapy for dogs until like a couple of years ago. Until like one of my dogs was a bit wobbly or his legs like had problems, and I was like, I don't think a vet can solve this. If only we had physio, and then like we found a physio. So right. that's great. Um, okay, and I guess speaking about uh, your current profession, right, um, since you're a dog physio, I, I, and I guess how we met also is um, I found you on, oh, my, my god sister actually recommended your physio place to me. I was like, oh, okay, and then the name is Fiddles Paw Pose, right, yeah. uh, which I think is a very cute name, by <laughs> the way, but tell me, how, mm. did you, how did you think of, uh, how did this name come about, and... Um, yeah, t- I guess give me an idea of like what you guys do. Okay, uh, so uh, the name uh, Fido's Poppers. Oh. Fi- yeah, Fido's. No, no worries. Uh, so Fido's basically, uh, Fido is just a generic name for dogs, mm. right? Like how you have Fifi for cats mm. and for horses, they call Bronco. Oh. Yeah, so, so Fido means dog. So it's essentially Fido's then Poppers. Poppers is actually a portmanteau or a play of two words. Typically, like if you think about purpose, yeah, so we want to do, we are trying to explore and enable uh, enable a dog's purpose. Oh, 
more. Right. Purpose, yeah. So, oh, okay. Yeah, but there's also a subliminal kind of message behind it. Because if you think about it, purpose, purpose, okay, however you pronounce it, the post actually is also very critical to the work that we do. Right. Because we are trying to also suggest uh, to the audience or, or our clientele that we are very keen or very acutely uh, anal or very, very particular about how a dog should pose. Correct. Not 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 so much in a very unintentional way, but they should how how like how they stand, how they you know stand conformed, mm. how they should uh, position themselves when they move. Mm. So 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 it's a play of those words. Yeah. And and putting it all together, we are trying to extract right the potential from a dog while maintaining movement. And and and, uh, and and mobility in the process. So that's what's uh, you know in the name when we came to decide on how you know Fido's poppers should 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 be. Yeah. Ah, sorry. I, I think maybe very Singapore. So Fido, right? Yeah, yeah, Fido. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but oh, I I like the poppers. So I thought of it in the second way. Like yep. it's like poppers. Yeah. Kind of that's why I think I said Fido's poppers. Right. Yep. <laughs> oh wow! I, that's so smart. The poppers thing. Correct. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, we've got a lot of people had uh, actually thought for uh, Fido's was my actual name. <laughs> yeah, so so that's not uncommon, you know. We've had people like, "Hi, Fido." Then I'm like, "Uh, so yes. Uh, are you referring to me? Uh, oh, I thought you were Fido. No, no, no. Fido's just a general name for a dog. So, <laughs> yeah. So I mean, uh, but but it's a good way to then educate them because then they'll be asking, "Why why such a weird name? You know, why you don't name yourself like something a little bit more simp- uh, you know, simple, mm. more straightforward, like you know, canine uh, re- rehab center or something? You know, Mm-mm-mm. yeah. So but but no lah. You know, I think we want it to be a talking point for most people. You know? So the more we so called confuse them, maybe it gives them more like a chance to really think through deeply about what they want and mm. then you know, sending the message very subtly through them. So I guess talking about dog physiotherapy, right? Maybe can you share a little bit of insight um, into the role of dog physiotherapy and its importance in the well-being of dogs? Like, for example, and I think as we're growing up, right? It's like, oh, if there's anything wrong with my dog, the first thing I'll do is like, let me bring my dog to a vet, right? right. But now... <laughs> as I guess parenting is more prominent, I guess in Singapore mm-hmm. especially, um, then uh, like you said, more and more of these um, allied health <laughs> services for mm-hmm. dogs are like popping up as well. Um, yeah, so would love to learn a little bit more about, um, yeah, I think when should we visit you guys versus a vet, you know? Right. So uh, I think, okay, maybe we start off with that process, but when, when should a, a, a client or an owner see us? I think there could be two ways to look at it. Mm. So some clients come to us because they, they come with us with the intention of just having a second opinion uh, to look at how the dog walks. You know, so it was just not so much the dog had any form of lameness. Mm. Uh, they just think that the dog is just walking fine, but they just want to see whether there's anything wrong from a musculoskeletal kind of perspective. Mm. So they come in, you know, they had you know, no impressions in mind that there could be some issues going on. But during the process, we, you know, we find out, hey, you know, I think that the hips aren't great, you know. It's walking with a little bit mm. of impairment. It may not occur or it may not appear as being very prevalent to the owner because, I mean, most of them may not may not see it as an impairment. But then we say, hey, okay, at that point in time, maybe it's not critical, but I suggest maybe bringing up to your vet. Okay, these are the clinical observations. I think there could be something going on, but I think we'll let the vet diagnose, mm. right? Because they are in the right position to diagnose. We don't. Uh, so then they can do diagnostics, we can help. And that's how we kind of assist, not say assist the vet, but more of like we, we help complement the process by saying that, okay, these, this could be potential problem areas. And then the vet will take this up and then do his own exploration mm-hmm. based on our kind of inputs to see. And truly, if there's a, a, a case you know, that, that is clinically diagnosed, then we will help the dog, you know, so-called, uh, get back to mobility if it's appropriate. Mm. And there could be the other also a spectrum where uh, vets refer cases to us. You know, so uh, so that's more like the preventive side, you know. Uh, but of course, more on the uh, kind of rehab side. Then we got uh, clients that come to us say after surgery, say they may go for a hip surgery, they go for a spinal surgery, and and how do you help the dog recover faster, mm. right? Uh, most times, or at least up until recently, uh, the general idea or the gold standard was just to crate rest the dog for eight weeks, and you could imagine or you could appreciate that uh, in the whole period of resting, the dog is not going to be moving. Mm. They're going to lose a lot of muscle mass. They're going to get very frustrated. So how do you accelerate the process? So we help uh, we help them do things to preserve range of motion in the joints. Mm. Uh, you know, help pain swelling through say uh, different kind of uh, medical equipment that we use. 
So some of them can include laser therapy, electrical stimulation therapy, uh, manual type therapies. So hopefully we can kind of preserve the range and preserve the musculoskeletal uh, kind of uh, function such that, you know, they can return to, say, normal activity a lot quicker mm. and they recover a lot better. And, you know, hopefully, yeah. And, and, and I think that eliminates a lot of all that potential that can go wrong if they choose to, say, for example, uh, just stay in create all, all eight weeks. Mm. I, I guess I wish we knew about this earlier, like my... Mm. Uh, we have a poodle, right? Yeah. Um, I think he dislocated his shoulder like mm. at least 17 times. Right. And then the last time we went for surgery, they like, uh, what's the word? Like bandaged his arm like yep. here. Like the whole arm was like there, right? Yeah. And then the vet was like, oh, um, leave it there for a month, right? And then I think two weeks in, he was like scratching and biting and we were trying to go near him. He was like growling, which is not very typical of his behavior. Right. And then when we took the bandage out. Oh, it was like, uh, it wasn't rotting, but it was like, because it's moist inside and, and maybe he sweat or something. Yeah, it was um, just very moist and it was like stinking um, and all that. And I was like, what? So I wish we knew all this. Like, we probably would have gone to you to like, you know, help him um, figure out like, how do you recover better and, and things like that. Yeah, also. possibly. I think uh, good that you mentioned because this morning uh, we were also approached by a, a client who has uh, you know, decided to come in because uh, they have had a massive, huge wound uh, because the dog's just lying on your side for so long, right? So, uh, so yeah, I mean, although one's normal kind of, um, I'll say, perception would be just to rest the dog, but, you know, uh, in cases like this, is how do you then just, you know, instead of just leaving it to just recover on its own, how can we accelerate? So laser therapy, like what we usually do, we help the dogs to get back to, you know, to normal faster, help them to heal the tissues faster mm. uh, and then what happens the dog can return to function so so a lot of these options that weren't made available are now actually quite available readily in a lot of places so uh, us being one of them so you, you realise that actually a lot of dogs are I mean owners are quite thankful mm. uh, that you know uh, and, and it's, it's not at a very expensive price point also uh, so so yeah so I mean a lot of options to help them get back to function so they can resume their normal lives yeah. you know yeah, without so much uh, of a hindrance okay I guess Moving on to kind of like the next question. Um, I think we share very interesting, similar backgrounds in a yeah. sense where I um, I know you had a career in HR as well. So I also mm. had a career in HR. Um, but I'm very curious to know, like, what's your personal journey of really transitioning from the world of HR um, to becoming a dog physiotherapist instead? Like, what inspired you to make this career change? Uh, so, very good question. Um, how it all started was I had a, a dog. His name uh, his name is Dagger. He's now seven years old. Uh, so, he's a corgi. He's a black corgi. Oh, uh, yeah. So, yeah, he's a black corgi. He's uh, unfortunately been diagnosed uh, with hip dysplasia. Oh, no. Yeah, so that's something uh, we didn't know quite quite a lot about, you know, uh, up until maybe six, six years ago. Mm. So, when he first got diagnosed, I mean, there weren't really much options there. You know, uh, it was surgery either way. Or, I mean, it's not something that I'm discounting or I'm not receptive to, but but most times, because he's still walking fine, he's still able to use the limbs, he's not, you know, having muscle loss, so to speak. Uh, so we were trying to explore alternative ways to try to, you know, prolong or see how we can manage with mm. uh, without surgery. So mm, there was only one other practice. Uh, so we, we went to them. Uh, you know, we found that actually, truly enough, there could be some, uh, you know, um, benefits from from doing what they did. And I think that was the point in time I said that, okay, you know, why why not try, instead of buying a new uh, property or buy a new house, you know, as an investment, uh, why not just take this money, uh, put it into an, uh, an, as an investment, right? And to, to just get your feet into the game, uh, some skin into the game as to like uh, helping or, or like trying to grow a business of this nature. Mm -hmm. So that was the intention. Uh, but then I think what happened is uh, that didn't work out. So then I decided to just, you know, since I've already gotten so much inside, uh, might as well just make something good out of it. So then, you know, you force yourself to really just humble yourself down, uh, start maybe learning from others, you know, going around, talking to vets and all that. So, so it, it all started, I mean, I would say uh, by a happen of consequence, as in like, because, you know, you've got so much skin in the game, you have no choice and you just have to do it. But also, I suppose it helped accelerate the process of decision making a lot better because it was something that I wanted to do so far back uh, but but now I just feel that okay you know what if I'm going to do it I I have to do it right and I'm going to do it well as well mm. so so that's how it came to be uh, and then from that point on is is it's really almost a three four year journey 
uh, trying to get you know the appropriate qualifications, the credentials, and all you know uh, even getting your reputation up within the industry so that people don't really see you as more like a not say an imposter but just trying to you know make a quick buck out of everybody you mm, know mm, because mm. it is a, a very very a therapeutic role that we are playing so it's not something that we can just go out and just you know just you know just just play without any form of uh, experience I would say. You so you mentioned it was like a three to four year investment thing. Was that? Uh, something you did before you started uh, the clinic? Or do I call it a clinic or do I call it like a... Yeah, you can call it a clinic. You can call it like a physiotherapy facility. doesn't uh, matter. I mean, it's quite interchangeable actually. Mm, okay, okay. Uh. So, uh, yeah, because you mentioned you, you did all mm. that to get all the qualifications and things like that. Uh, right. So, is that something you did first before starting the business as well? Uh, so, it wasn't. Uh, I mean, I was... Okay, when, when I was looking to invest, that was something I wanted to do. I uh, wanted to kind of just phase myself in slowly, uh, you know, so I mean, still maintaining my current job and just, you know, taking leave and just do these courses so mm. you get qualified in the process. Uh, but, you know, of course, things didn't work out. So, you know, I'm now stuck in a position whereby, well, it's either make it or break it. So so then it became a, a very tough decision of trying to say that how do I then compress my education or like how do I get started, you know, because, you know, uh, initially the plan was to have a whole uh, so-called architecture built around you know, where you have therapists already, you know, kind of just doing it and you just shadow them. But now I have no one. So how do you then pick yourself up? And so, yeah, so you just have to humble yourself down. So it all started out with maybe just, you know, learning some basic animal behavior courses. So this could be somewhat like done online. Uh, you know, some of them, uh, I, I do spend quite a lot of time traveling overseas. I would have made, I would, if I looking back, I would have made easily 10, 15 trips easily to the UK and to the US over three years. Uh, just to really acquire very skill specific kind of training with with uh, with different people, so like I spent time in Colorado with horses, understanding mm-hmm. how horses kind of work, uh, learning you know how to calm yourself and you know have a maintain a certain energy level, because horses get spooked quite easily. Mm. So if you can work around horses, very likely you can work around dogs. Mm. You know, so so these are all you know. It, on its own, it doesn't seem very, very, very helpful. But if you put everything together, you realize it actually is a mishmash of, of really a lot of things. And I think it, it creates that whole nexus of expertise that we can offer clients that most other people can't. Mm. You know, because we come from a perspective of we understand the animal behavior. We are very experts in therapeutic exercise. Uh, we also know training very well. So we can integrate a lot of the components together. Uh, but yet at the same time, you know, my background in HR also allows me to have and build that interpersonal connection with the client yes. and how to extract that, you know, uh, and, and empower them in the process so they can change, manage the dog's lifestyle such that it can also get uh, yield better outcomes therapeutically for their own dogs and for, for everyone else in the family. Mm. So I think, yeah, so I think that that's how the whole journey kind of started. So in that three years, I think um, it's allowed me to build on all these platforms and uh, and then create a unique niche for, for ourselves. Mm. I mean, I definitely think you have a very calming presence. Mm. Oh, <laughs> I mean, when <laughs> when I, I um when I went to to uh Fido's, right? I just mm. go and shop yeah. it to Fido's. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah. Uh, when I walked in, I was like, oh, I so um <clears throat> you can feel the vibe of the place. It's just like pretty nice. And then when I met you, I was like, oh, and I feel like dogs can feel it too. You know, when like uh people are f- like generally when people are afraid of dogs, I feel like they can sense it very easily also. Mm. And then all the more uh Chewy will go and like the people right Correct. um yeah my toy poodle's a bit naughty sometimes but she's just like very easy and very open mm. with um you and cynthia right? yeah so um t- for contact cynthia is is uh the manager for the yes the correct office. so cynthia is our practice manager she helps us with quite a lot of matters on top of the clients mm. yeah so she she carries largely a back-end role but i think uh, but a lot of clients have grown to love her so, so she's also somewhat, you know, still very fr- front-facing, essentially. And we are, yeah, we're looking forward to have a new member on, on board as well. So that's going to happen in the next month or so. So we're going to have quite a big team relative to where we started two, three years ago. Was it just you when you started? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> One <laughs> man show. <laughs> yeah, it's always tough, you know. Uh, yeah, And it came at a point in time, this was during Circuit Breaker, actually. Mm. So, you know, rents were cheap. We just decided to do this as a passion project. You know, just see how it goes and, you know, uh, things picked up from there, lah. I think the sincerity cuts through all that kind of, you know, uh, thing. So, and I, I think I'm, I feel quite fortunate and blessed. So, essentially, yeah. So, I think, you know, I'm just going to continue doing what's right by the clients who stood by us and also to, to engage newer clients who, you know, who have started kind of just, you know, learning of our reputation in the market mm. uh, and, and, you know, build on that legacy uh, pretty much. 
Do you feel like a lot of your clients are through word of mouth? Yes. I can safely say I have not spent a single dollar in, uh, in advertising. Mm. So uh, we have grown organically uh, more than 50% year on year. Mm. Uh, we started out, I think, very safely, uh, maybe about two clients a week. Mm. You know, of course, it was loss-making. Uh, when we started out two clients a week and that was only through Instagram, you know, people started inquiring. They just wanted to come for fun to see. They thought it was a dog playground. <laughs> and I think the intention was when we started was more like a playground, like a gym of sorts, you know, mm. just to get an, uh, yeah, people to come out. And I think it, it played onto a very, very good point in time because that was during the circuit breaker. Nobody could do a lot of uh, activities, right? Mm. So they just wanted an outlet for them to do all those things. And, and we were that outlet for them. Uh, and, and I could say safely now we've organically grown to more than what 500, 600 clients that wow, we've seen okay. yeah, and out of which I think maybe a good 10-15% of them are still ongoing uh, regulars that have stuck with us uh, throughout all these years mm, yeah I think it's very it's great to hear that you're growing like so organically which also shows like you guys are good also you know you know your stuff and um, yeah I think the clearly there has have been results right that's right. why people keep coming back also Correct. So I think we are very result-oriented. Uh, we are very driven in that sense as well. Uh, so we tell clients that, you know, I mean, essentially we, we give them very good milestones. Uh, it's not so much like you just come and, you know, some, some places may tell you that, oh, you just continue coming, you come 20 times, 30 times, and, you know, we'll get there somehow, but, but there's really no clear end. Yes. Uh, so for us, we tell them, you know, well, let's just try for a month. You know, there's not much commitment. It's just for a month. We see how your dog responds. Right. If your dog is uh, responding well, and by all means, if you feel and you believe in the process, then I'm happy for you to come back. Mm. But it's never a stipulated agreement that we force you to come back or, you know, if you don't come back, your dog's not going to get better. So we leave the choice entirely up to the owner. We don't have to preach so much, but we just lay out all the options for them out there mm. and they take the decision themselves. Mm. And I think that's the best way around because uh, hard, I mean, what you call that? hard selling is not going to work it in this era. Yeah. And I think we try to sell value. We try to sell a solution to your problem. Uh, but also at the same time uh, empowering you in the process so you can have an outlet to kind of bond with your dog while you're doing therapy and even getting the owners involved so they mm. get a hands-on uh, experience as to how, how this could work in the home environment after they so-called graduate with us. Mm. I think that's so interesting because um, <coughs> I think I can relate a bit like me trying to build up my business or my audience, right, uh, mm. on social media. Mm. Like I think when you mentioned about adding value to people, I think that's uh, just super important. Like, you if you keep at, uh, giving people value for free, I think people will naturally just like, oh okay, I'll come to you. And um, yeah, I just I just was able to kind of like resonate with that point. Like, I agree also. Mm. Like, it's you can't do hard selling nowadays. Like, people will be like, oh. I think it's <laughs> like people will be super turned off. Right. But if you approach them, um, you know, with the intent of just giving and sharing and helping, I think that goes. Uh, pretty long way. La. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So uh, I've never been one, or at least the whole team uh, has never been one to withhold knowledge. I mean, anybody that comes by, we are happy to share, we are prepared to kind of share, you know, we, we're, we're even happy to even have them sit down and you know, we, we show them how to do things. Uh, I think there's really no fear. In, I mean, of course, some people will be like, you know, why, why would you be sharing this stuff? Because, you know, that means that you make yourself redundant. But to me, you know, uh, it doesn't matter. I think, you know, where, where things... Uh, uh, I mean, where things should be shared, I think we should share and hopefully they pass it on to someone. And my view is that there's not going to be, you know, uh, a so-called a uh, finite number of people that, that have dogs. There's going to be a growing number. You know, some of these um, may continue to come back to us. They may refer their friends. And I think that the cycle, the ongoing cycle is, is going to be better because I think first and foremost, it allows you more opportunities to, to help more dogs, essentially, mm. rather than just say, hey, you know what, I'm just going to just withhold all the information, just work with you uh, and, you know, just try to fear monger the process. No, I think that's not really who we are. Mm. Yeah, so yeah. so we are very, very open about that. And, you know, uh, we, we never pressure clients like, even to buy packages or like, you know, say that, oh, you need to have 20 packages in order for your dog to get yeah. better because we are confident of our own abilities. Yeah. So if you like the process, you know, I don't have to, you know, like lock you in. Yes. You just yes, come yes. back. Yeah, I love that because I think, I mean, number one, that reminds me of a lot of facial places. Yeah. <laughs> but also uh, with other physio places I've been mm. to like, for dogs, right? Yeah, it's true. There's always that, that package kind of thing. So... Yeah. I, I love your approach in, in that sense. And like, I think, yeah, people can just feel the sincerity. Correct. Which is, which is very nice. La. And right. I feel like that is what sets you apart from all these people also. So it's very 
cool that you go with your own style also. Correct. And I think that that creates, I mean, I mean, you know, we're all about diversity, right? I mean, everybody is very, very open. Uh, I mean, like, uh, you have your own unique traits. Mm-hmm. Uh, everybody has their own niche. And I think they should just, you know, uh, tap on that niche to, to cater to a different market group. And I think there's always more than enough business to go around. So I never had a feel that, you know, like I'm trying to compete with one another. Mm-hmm. If the, I mean, if we have more people going to the industry, it means that, you know, there's, there's a lot more room for growth for everybody. It elevates the expertise and the standards. So, so I've never been one that says that, oh, you know, I'm very, very afraid of my competitors. No, I'm always very, very happy when I see competitors growing you know, and, and all that because it just makes a, a better case for us to elevate our position and our, uh, you know, our, our expertise in the industry. Yeah, it's that um the abundance mindset versus That's like correct. the competitor mindset, which I also feel makes you feel less um, what's the word? Very like okay, every time for example, if I'm thinking about why is my growth only this much, right? If I'm yeah. thinking about my own journey, my own growth, um it's cool to see my my journey, right? Right. Uh to see like, oh, you know, last time this year I only had like 20 followers now i'm at like 400 you know yeah. it's 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 very good progress but if you if i compare myself to someone else who's like oh last year they had 20 and now they have like 40,000 i'll be like mm. it, it it the feeling sucks lah. Yeah. so i think if we always approach it from that manner it's also not very good for like your mental health in that sense right. so i feel approaching it from an abundant mindset um healthier but also it's better also, la, you know, you should yeah. also um, value your own growth in that certain sense. That's correct. And I mean, you know, I think I'm very into the whole sustained growth kind of mentality. Um, I'm not one, like, to be honest, like, if, if you were to present me with a very hypothetical case, say, for example, now there's 300 people at the door waiting to consult with me. I don't think I even have the capacity to do that. And, you know, there's no way I'm going to scale up a business just purely for these 300 people. Uh, and I think there has to be some thought and some, you know, into this whole thing. So I'm, I'm always of the view that, uh, you know, uh, I mean, everything, yeah, we want to grow sustainably. We want to make sure that, you know, because we are responsible that not just for our own family's lives, but the, the lives of the people that work for us, that work with us. Mm. So I think we need to ad- ensure adequately that we, you know, we, we provide for them. We have enough uh, resources that they can continue to develop and grow. So speaking about your career change, right? Mm. Um. I'm very curious to know how did you kind of navigate that transition like I guess financially mm-hmm. mentally also like what did your friends and family say like did their opinions really affect you in, in any way because I know when I made my own leap of faith mm. let's say um, I also try to build up my own financial runway um, you know I had friends I, I think most of my friends and family were quite supportive of what I was doing but I can imagine it's probably different for everyone also and of course we have adulting needs and we need to live our lives and you know that sort of thing so i'm very curious to know how how did that go for you how did you navigate that also right uh of course it's, it's very very capital intensive right i mean especially at this current day and age uh i, I i'm not going to lie that it's going to be quite difficult uh you know i think first and foremost i think i'm quite lucky in the sense whereby i think my previous job helped to finance a lot of these things mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we managed to kind of set aside a lot of finances that helped to you know allow me to do what I wanted to do. But uh, for those who don't really have the luxury of these means, I think it's just really about trying to find uh, opportunities. You know, uh, within you know where I mean within your your own space. I think there's there's a lot of potential opportunities that that you can really work towards and and trying to get your foot into the whole industry. Uh, but relative to my own. Um, my friends and family were generally quite supportive. I think it, it helps having a, a partner uh, that, that could really resonate or like, you know, how to say, like agree with your views. So that, you know, uh, helps with the, the social support, right? Uh, if you, you know, going back, you don't have someone that's nagging down, you know, on you. What, what are you doing? Why, 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 why are you not doing stuff today? You know, are you just reading today? Yeah. yeah so, so I think having that social uh, support is helpful. Um, then, of course, uh, financially, it's always tough because, uh, you know, like I say, all these causes and all these opportunities are not available locally. So there's a lot of spending uh, that has to happen to travel to various, various countries to kind of acquire all that knowledge. Uh, so I think uh, it, it's just tough. Uh, and I think just have to be very scrappy. Uh, so what, what we did was, uh, yeah, you know, like very, very minimal travel for own leisure and all that. And I think at some point, but, you know, you just have to have that very clear goal in mind that, uh, you know, that at some point you're going to come to a stage where you can start, you know, providing value. And then, then that's where your, your so-called financial runway starts to, to happen. 
up until you know maybe 20 30 years down the road mm. yeah so so that's how it is for me uh i would say that it's a struggle more of like uh, in terms of and emotionally also i think like say learning and acquiring all that knowledge uh like say having especially since i'm not of a science background I think learning how to then you know, go back, you know, studying A-level science, you know, say for example, uh, when you're 30, it's not something that you typically want to do, uh, but you just have to go back there, you know. And then, uh, you know, uh, also you know, learning from all the veterinarians that are you know, helpful. I think most, most, most people generally are very, very helpful uh, if you ask them right, because you're not there to steal the rice bowl. Mm. You're just there to really try to say, just gather some knowledge so you can benefit the industry as a whole. So I think, you know, uh, emotionally, it's about really trying to capture all these opportunities and then convert them into something that could be, you know, uh, I would say, a uh, fuse of knowledge for, for you to kind of just tap on and, you know, uh, and grow and, and just to recap uh, as you kind of progress in your own journey. Mm, I agree. <laughs> Financially, I also agree in terms of, uh, like, you know, my all these gears and cameras and stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. I think I... I mean, I only had the money to get them because I, I worked previously in like my in HR for like 10 years, right? That's correct. <laughs> if not, I wouldn't yeah. be able to fund myself in, in these ways also. Uh, and I agree in terms of the just chatting with people. Sometimes you learn so much. Yep. Um, I, I really, like even from today's chat, I'm, I'm right. learning a lot also. Right. In, in mm-hmm. Even though it's, um, you know, I mean, in different respects, right? Uh, even though we're talking about... Um, dog physio for example but i still learn from you from like the business standpoint and things like that so i find that like it's good to connect uh, sometimes no i agree Uh, i mean uh, every there's there's no one bad opportunity i tell everybody right i mean if there's something to you know there's always something in every conversation that you can always recall and hey you know someone said this someone said that you know Mm. and then it helps shape your thinking and you know yeah and and, and this is important and you know uh, so yeah so even even just talking to the everyday person i think sometimes they can really help you rechannel and you know just just you know reflect mm. you know whether retrospectively or not but i mean you know just reflect and i think all, all these will really contribute towards your own personal and professional growth so i guess as a dog physiotherapist right um what are some of the most rewarding aspects of your work like do you have any memorable success stories um, you can share with us? Sure. Uh, actually, quite a lot, but I'll probably just share a few, some snippets of what we think that may be really helpful. Uh, I think uh, one of those that really stuck with us, or at least me personally, is really a when you can convert some sceptical people you know, into a, a loyal client mm. that sticks for long, I think that speaks a lot. Uh, you know, I mean, most people come with the mindset, oh, you know, just stepping on this board here, stepping on that board there, just, you know, putting some light on that area, you know, why why is this going to change my dog, you mm. know? I can do that at home too. Uh, and then you realise, you no, know, my dog is walking better. It seems that, you know, yeah, you know, he's getting stronger. He he didn't used to jump on the bed, now he's jumping. Then I said, well, uh, that's a different problem altogether. <laughs> now you have to seek a trainer, right? Because we don't, we don't, we don't encourage the jumping. Mm. But the fact that the dog, is, uh, the dog is now willing to jump shows that there's some degree of confidence that we have developed over time. Maybe some of that pain has been managed, so the dog doesn't feel so uncomfortable doing so. And, and so these are just very, very happy moments that we see. Uh, so sceptical clients who come, you know, and just like, you know, just, you know, and, and some of them can be quite critical. Mm-hmm. They come in, they'll be like, oh, is it, mm, mm, yeah, okay, oh, just, just stretch, stretch, pull, pull, you know, that's it. Huh? You know, but then, you know, they turn out to be the most loyal clients. They bring clients and they, you know, they're they like walking ambassadors for us. So I think these are very, very good success stories because, you know, it relates to the everyday person, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's just one of them. And of course, uh, like more recently, uh, one of those good things are, uh, people who have held back on, on rehab mm. you know, uh, for their dogs because they think the dog is walking fine. Uh, but but truth, truth be told, it's actually uh, the dog isn't. You know, and they'll be like, oh, you know, maybe I should go to just, you know, do something else or just leave it be. Uh, and, and when they truly come and they realize, hey, actually within one session, within two sessions, they realize the dog, you know, has a better posture. And it's all just relating to, you know, just really just pain relief. Mm. You know, so, uh, so yeah, so not not... Uh, not preventing the dog from having pain relief is is also something that uh that not it triggers us but it's more of like something that I think inhibits a lot of the dogs uh, to do better. So you know having that conversation with us where we are an impartial party, you know we are we don't promote the use of like you know like a, a invasive you mm. know kind of procedures. So so they they feel that we are their partner in this. Mm. You know so I think that helps and I think you know when when they say when people come back and tell us hey they feel very consult uh, they, they feel that we are very consultative mm. it, it, it's very nice and they like the kind of a uh, bit side uh, it, it's more like a collaboration between mm. two parties rather than me tell you what to do. 
So these are very, very nice, comforting things that are really the plus side of the job. Mm. And then when we see dogs that, you know, may have not been able to walk, you know, and now suddenly walking again, I think, yeah, yeah, I think that's a, that's a very, very good sign. Uh, but it comes with its own set of, uh, I would say, sadness as well. Yes. Uh, I mean, because, you know, the nature of the case is, you know, we see a lot of clients that may be compromised. They may have immune-mediated conditions. Mm. And, and some of these go, uh, you know, uh, some of these cases do pass on. And, you know, just in this year alone, we may have had four or five. Oh, no. And there's one last week as well. So it's quite unfortunate, you know. Uh, the dog was scheduled to actually come back to us after a review but you know she just didn't take well to anesthesia she just didn't make it yeah oh man yeah so 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 it's quite it's quite sad so so it's cases like this that bum us out uh you know it, you know you try to compartmentalize and tell you know it's not your fault but but you know sometimes it, it just gets in the way because you felt that maybe you know if you had not maybe um tried to promote that the dog should do certain things uh they would have maybe wanted to kind of explore those conditions a little bit more uh uh, assertively and you know mm. but 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 you know it is what it is you know so um we we yeah you know, i think it, it, it just all, i mean it, it's just very draining so i think what happens is uh we, we we all need we all need to find some outlets to be able to kind of manage this because we don't want this to manifest into say uh uh you know the next client and you know mm. it, it's just a very very tough job sometimes you know you just feel very helpless yeah yeah, yeah. i, I yeah. can imagine you, somebody you can absorb that emotion also and then like you said, the the vibe is also quite important, right? When That's the correct. next client comes to you, how do you then like compose yourself and then uh, take care of the next client as best as you can? That's correct. So yeah, it, it, I think it takes training and I think sometimes it's not that we are not being concerned because, you know, understandably, it's not like we can just switch on and off, but, you know, we are human beings after all. Mm. But, but you know, it, it does take a lot of practice. And I think being in HR helps because, you know, sometimes you just have to turn the switch on and off, right? Yes. Like sometimes you do retrenchments one, uh, you know, one, one, one hour, next minute you have to go and welcome someone on board and the kind of things. So so I think that helps. But for the regular lay person who can, can find this quite a struggle, it's very, very hard to turn on and off. And for, for someone can, uh, who may not be familiar, can find this really, really draining. Mm. I think I'm familiar with it but I, I hate doing it like I hate feeling inauthentic or like and I'm very I feel I'm not good at um like if I'm upset it's on my face like you see it you know and wow just practicing the hiding it sometimes is it's so tough so especially when mm. you, you love animals so much and like you know mm. oh, if anything happens mm. to like my dog I'll be like oh I cannot correct uh, yeah I think yeah, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, I think it's okay being authentic. I think, you know, we are we are here not to try to, you know, be stoic and just to cover mm. up. You know, I think most clients generally understand if you have had a bad day. But it's, it's just, that's why I think it's important to have a team, like, you know, who can kind of just help you and pick yourself up, uh, pick each other up. I think uh, one of those kind of key things I realized is if you're operating alone, you don't have the outlet to really talk through, you know. Uh, yeah, then I think that becomes a challenge. Because mm. once you kind of keep it all to yourself, then you, you end up actually harboring all that kind of uh, negative thoughts and, you know, it becomes, you know, it manifests in you. You start having imposter syndrome. You know, did you do well? You know, even though I know that was the right decision, but, but you know, maybe it wasn't. You, know, you still doubt yourself. Mm. So, so, yeah, so important to talk through someone. For my, this podcast, right? Yeah, I, it's the first time I've actually hired a team. Yeah. Mind-blowing in a sense because uh, I used to do, like, with content creation and all that. Of course, there's a lot... I have to do, I have to script, I have to produce things, I have to edit, I have to market it. So having a team come in to help me has been, yeah, the word is mind-blowing. I just feel so much more supported and like um, I can delegate out some work, right? Um, when did you decide to hire someone? I guess Cynthia is your first hire, That's right? Correct. So when did you decide like I, I need someone to come help me out also? Okay, it does happen through happenstance, actually. Uh, it wasn't a case that I was actively looking to hire. I mean, I knew I could use someone, uh, but I think it came, I mean, but she approached me. Mm. Yeah. So it turned out that uh, Cynthia, our hire, actually had previously worked with our own dogs before. Mm. Uh, she used to work in daycare. Uh, and, and she's of a vet nurse background. So, so and you know, everything kind of played very well, played out really nicely because, you know, it was at that point in time, brand was quite manageable. We were growing and, you know, uh, 
it wasn't enough to cover, say, most of the bills, but it was enough to justify that, you know, if we have her, we could potentially scale up a little bit more mm. because we can collectively see more clients, we can add more value, we can charge more for the service. Mm. Uh, and I think clients are willing to pay because having two to one, uh, two, I mean, a ratio of two therapists to one dog is going to be better la, because mm. you get more value out of the whole, uh, whole, whole session, so to speak. Mm. So... Uh, so that was when you know we just went in without any kind of expectations, uh, and I think Cynthia or our first hire also knew that, uh, you know. And of course, uh, the challenge is learning to delegate because working alone is just one part of the process. So there wasn't really much communication. It was like I just did what I needed to do, and she's like just left there, like you know, thinking how she should kind of follow, uh, follow through. So I think of course in between there's there's going to be some disagreements over how certain things are being run, uh, but I think that helps us to reflect a little bit. Mm. You know, so now uh, fast forward, it's been uh, what now more than a year, uh, and you know I think there's come a time where you feel that okay, you know what, uh, we have kind of just reached that peak, right, where both of us can contribute in terms of our hours, but yet still maintaining some degree of sanity so that we can still you know uh, 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 provide very very good service without feeling so drained, mm. and that's why we see okay now we have got this peak, but now let's let's try to. Uh, hire someone, so it may mean that we have to kind of dip into like a sort of a valley for a little bit mm. because. Uh, you know, there's additional costs, you know, we don't have enough clients to sustain the additional growth. But I'm always of the opinion that we should kind of prepare uh, and, and scale up. Because if you never want to kind of come out of the comfort zone and make yourself feel that you need this person, you'll always be stuck with where you are. Mm. So so, uh, so in that sense, yes, I think, so I think having learned from the first experience, I think now then, of course, you've got to, you know, uh, how to say, like, uh, make sure the architecture is pretty much right for the new person and in the last year or so we have kind of refined that process so that you know, the next person doesn't have to kind of go through all that and we're going to then you know focus on, on greater things so, mm. uh, like, you know maybe like scaling the business how do we then you know reach out to more clients work on engagement of the owners how do we then you know measure uh, customer, uh, uh, customer experience with us so a lot more tangible things that we can now use you know uh, to, to better elevate ourselves in the industry mm. and like I think you said you have a Someone to bounce off uh, the, like, emotionally, like, you know, about the clients and also, um, I guess, if you are stuck on some problem, you have you have heard to kind of, like, talk through it also. I really feel like uh, talking through stuff with someone, like, we really underestimate that. Um, cool. It's, cool. like, a small thing, but, like, it really helps a lot sometimes just to say it out loud or just to, like, collaborate, you know, on, like, they give you another perspective you might not have thought about if it was just you. Yeah, exactly. So I think we all need to realize as human beings, we all have blind spots, right? And I mean, it may not, even even no matter how much we sometimes consciously think or we tell ourselves that we, 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 we do try to look out for these blind spots, but the fact is nobody really can look out for every single one. Mm. It takes someone to tell you. Uh, so I think it's important to differentiate between criticisms and really just be there to help you, right? Someone's there to help you. So in, of course... Uh, I think going into this, you know, one must have the mindset to filter between, say, uh, uh, criticism and and really that you know that she's giving true, truly good feedback that you know wants that she has equally vested as you are because she wants you to grow. You know, she mm. wants everybody to grow. So and and if we can grow, you can provide that sense of leadership to to whoever. Then I think naturally, then you attract more people to you know to to do the same and replicate the same level of service to everyone else because mm. it all boils down from me, right? Yeah. Yeah. So and I think yeah, I, I hear you entirely. So I think uh, having that, the, the, you know, that uh, potential to bounce off ideas with everybody. Uh, I think and also like-minded people. And I think embrace diversity as well, like different differences. Like you know, it may not come across as something that you may normally traditionally want to do, but you know, just recognize that you know. Uh, but but yeah, it, it may actually all work out eventually at some point. And and you know yeah, so we embrace the diversity so to so that you can be a little bit more unique in your own way. Mm. Yeah, I, I always feel like, I mean, I guess now I'm a leader. It's just like, I, I I always wanted to lead a team when I was in like the corporate world. Right. But I always had a certain idea of like, oh, I mean, uh, I've experienced, I think, good leaders and not so good leaders, right? And I'm mm. always like, wow, this is like the one person I want to emulate when I become a leader and all that. And I guess I'm still learning to yep. do that because I think my style is very collaborative very mm. like oh what do you think I, mean, I think I, I I think I'm quite inclusive I don't know I should ask my team am yeah. I am I uh, but I think it's also a learning process because like you said I used to do everything by myself um, so now I try to over communicate also and I talk mm. to my team which I also hope is not too much but 
we just learn as we go. I think we get better from there. Yeah, that's correct. So, uh, you know, so one of the key takeaways I always feel is uh, setting boundaries. Mm. I think uh, so much so because not not everyone wants to be very, very involved. So, you know, so I think, you know, learning about their own needs and communicating enough so that they understand how or what the end goal should look like. And, you know, just uh, showing there that you're there for them. Uh, yeah. Individualizing every single process, I think that's the best way to go. There's no really form-fitting, like a cutter, like cookie-cutter kind of process. So mm. so I think uh, how with this kind of team is, you know, to trying to find your own individual so-called uh, motivation for each of them. Trying to, you know, and, and, and so so then that way you get more authentic answers from them. You get more, you know, a, a higher level of contribution. Uh, and, and then it makes for a very, very good uh, kind of a team, la, a robust kind of, a very resilient kind of team mm. that can really stand behind you and, you know, push for a, a very, very common goal that you want to achieve. I think previously we spoke a little bit about finances, right? So I personally struggle a lot with getting used to, I guess, freelancer kind of like income where it's very sporadic and I only get paid once a project is done. Um, it's definitely not a stable income as, you know, we get our monthly pay, right, in, in the corporate correct. world. How I guess starting out, how did you feel? You know, like um, do you still feel feel this way now? And how do you overcome it, or how do you think about uh, what are your thoughts? I guess on on this area of of financials. Right. So I always tell, or I've been very open with everybody, my clients included. Like you know, when we first started out, I think uh, I took only maybe say five percent of what I used to draw mm. as a corporate uh, say employee. Um, I think, but uh, like I said, because I had kind of put aside enough funds to mm. kind of sustain myself, so that wasn't the issue. Uh, but I think, of course, as you continue to grow the business, you realize you need more uh, investments. Mm. Of course, uh, I think it all boils down to expectations. So like instead of just going big and or, you know, go big or go home, I decided to do it very slowly. So it means uh, even like, you know, starting out in a small space, making do with what you have, um, and I'll say that's uh, making use of free resources where they come by. I think there's so many free resources out there, you know, on YouTube, on so many different places that you can learn from. Uh, so all this help with actually, I would say, just uh, managing the budgets. Mm. I mean, uh, a lot of time, I would say, you are also very enticed by actually leveraging. They say, you know, leveraging by this by this means uh, taking loans, uh, like, you know, loans from mm. banks and all that. Mm. So those are also avenues that we have actually, when we started out, you know, we, we tried, you know, cash advances, balances, balance transfers and all that. So so that helped to fund a lot of all the mm. other kind of costs that came. Uh, of course, they were not without uh, drawbacks because, you know, the repayment term sometimes can be quite uh, unfriendly. Uh, but I think as an every, uh, most entrepreneurs would have at, at some point gone to that point, you know. I can even safely say to some degree that, uh, you know, yeah, you only have maybe about $10, $15 in your bank. Yeah, and I think that was a, a low point. Uh. Mm. But then after that, then you start to tell yourself, you know what, it's not that bad after all. Yes, yeah, so what did we not do differently or what can we do differently? Uh, then I think from that point, it started picking up. Uh, so you, you'll never get used to not having that income, but I think it allows you to be a bit more creative. So... Uh, my own vision is not to really just rely on just your service as a way of your primary income. Mm. So uh, what, what I kind of did along the way was you know, sell products. You know, sell products can form maybe 10, 15% of your income. Mm. Uh, do some speaking. Like uh, I eventually managed to teach at a local polytechnic, mm. teaching animal rehab. So I did that, you know, uh, not only for the credentialing or, or, or for that, you know, uh, but, but it's also more for like just to really... Uh, get some teaching experience in because you know when you teach you know it forces you to also acquire knowledge it acquires you uh, it forces you to acquire a, a certain degree of uh, uh, I would say y y you have to educate you know you, you, it's not more like you're just doing it yourself yep. it's how to put together a practitioner kind of a program yeah. but in an educational form uh, and also um, how to say like during uh, I mean like offering uh, offering yourself out like you know working with associations uh, trying to 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 get them to buy into your idea, you know, offering free advice, uh, you know, so so yeah, so I think all these do contribute, and I think at some point you've kind of built a resilient ecosystem that allows you to kind of make, uh, make you feel a bit more stable. Mm. Yes, it's still not a fixed amount every month, but at least you go, you go back thinking, well, it, you know, if it covers all your costs, you know, uh, and you know, I don't depend on just one sole area. I think I can sleep better at night. I think of the point about, yeah, teaching. Yeah. So I feel like I'm, whenever I do my videos also, I, I also feel like um, I'm teaching someone also. Mm. And I think uh, the point on 
learning to when you teach you also learn that's and correct. also you 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 need to know how to break it down in a way that it's easy for a five or a ten year old to kind of like understand also like so it forces you to really know it inside out correct. so that's where the i think the learning bit comes in and like things are reinforced so i always found that like quite interesting like, when i'm trying to explain something to someone also right and I think that's important because, you know, a lot of times in the corporate world, uh, we are so used to using excessively uh, technical jargon. Mm. And I think, yeah, I mean, that may impress some people, but I think what's more impressive, I feel, if you can condense a topic that is so complex into a fi- something a five-year-old can appreciate, you know, I think that that's really a, a good point. And I think it's not something that's unique because if you look at banks, you know, uh, I, I know you're, you're, you're a lawyer by training, right? Yeah, so, <laughs> not yeah. really there but okay, yeah. sure. so uh, you know most most places are also trying to dumb their contracts down a little bit make it simpler for the uh, you know the everyday consumer to understand mm. so you can see that there's really some trajectory to try to get people to really I mean it's good to have that baseline knowledge but it doesn't mean that that should be kind of imposed on the, the everyday customer who have no legal background to not mm. be able to understand these things so I'm curious to know like how has this career change impacted your life personally and have you found more fulfillment and happiness in your work as a dog physiotherapist compared to your previous career in HR? Right. Uh, so I feel that at least in my work, in or I'll say close to a decade's worth of work in HR, uh, I mean, the goal was really to advance the company's interests uh, while still also trying to accommodate, uh, uh, I would say, the employees' uh, needs and trying to keep them happy, you know, to develop their potential. And that's still something uh, that I really love to do. Uh, it's, still, it's still really much really in my blood, right? Mm. But I think I've now come to learn and accept that, you know, um, as altruistic as I like to be, uh, most people don't really appreciate that when, you know, when you've come to a certain level or you've come to a certain point. Uh, but now working with dogs, you know, even though clients can still remain skeptical, some clients are, you know, they're still visiting, but they don't really, I mean, they don't really feel that they're equally involved. They just sit around and just, you know, do their own stuff while the dogs are in therapy. And it's all good because by at least seeing the dog, you know, uh, being a little bit more comfortable, they can yawn, they can sleep, uh, and, you know, they're just fully relaxed during the whole session. That that alone is already good enough satisfaction to us uh, to know that we have done something good, right? And I think, you know, we don't need any verbal validation. We don't need anyone saying, thank you, you know, you did a good job. But I think that that very act in itself, you know, knowing that the, the dog is comfortable, I think that, that says a lot. So um, I think, so that impact, I think, has uh, stuck with most of, I mean, m- at least for me, I think it stuck with me throughout. And uh, yeah, I think I find absolutely lots of fulfillment. Mm. Uh, because going back, you know that, you know, uh, yes, uh, you know, it's what we do is not just a numbers game. It's not like just trying to like, you know, cut, say, $3 million of a, a budget hit count of, of, of a company. But you are really, Im- you know, directly uh, impacting a sentient hum- uh, sen- uh, uh, actual living living thing right mm. and also impacting uh, the relationships they have with their own own family members so I think that that's re- that, that really says a lot I suppose mm. yeah, so so yeah I have, I have very great fulfillment I don't look back of course uh, so now I'm just trying to you know find more people who can you know emulate or at least you know uh, be part of this movement that I'm trying to create uh, you know to see how we can help more pets without it being so uh, uh, and while making it accessible rather mm, I love that like you educate us as owners also I right. think it's, and you, you take the time to explain things also right and I think if you look at it it's you know we are in this business not so much yes I mean of course profit is important to grow the team to pay for bills uh, but you know if you look at us in short we are pretty much enabling owners to look out for the dogs even more, mm. to enable them the opportunity to have that private time alone with the dogs because during that time they're with us, you can see that most of them tend to be very focused on their dog and you know that you know if, if, if it were not for this uh, unfortunate situation that they may come to us for their problems, uh, they may not even have that opportunity to want to have that really one-to-one time mm. and you know where it allows them to be vulnerable, they tell us their life story, they tell us you know the dog's life story and, you know, um, yeah, I think it's very, very fulfilling, uh, very empowering at the same time. Mm. So, so yeah, and I, I think while, while you know, uh, avoiding the whole social stigma that, uh, you know, oh, rehab is only for sick pets, it's only for, you know, dog, dogs that are old and dying, I think it can apply to every one of us, uh, you know, and, and, you know, making sure that, you know, it's, it's not something that they should avoid, you know, yeah, even healthy dogs can come for rehab, you know, just to help them condition so they can be a little bit better, yeah. Yes. So, yeah, so so yeah, so absolutely. Uh, we totally subscribe to the idea. Okay. So I call this the 
I mean, I don't really have a name for it yet, but I was like, oh, maybe we call it the depth quest or whatever. Sure. Anyway, um, from this block of Jenga's, right, there, uh, there's a number corresponding to it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, to every number, there is a question that corresponds to it also. Okay, got it. It's a life, a deep life question or whatever. I just thought it's like a fun activity to do. So you can pick out the a block okay. and then I will go find the number that it corresponds to. Okay, let's do this. Okay, let's see what what number do we have. This is number eight. Lucky number, number eight. eight. Wow, what, uh? <laughs> what, what? Lucky number eight. Okay. <laughs> and the question is, can you share a personal belief or value that has shaped the way you live your life? Uh, I think being authentic and compassionate. I think that goes a long way. Mm. Uh, I think being authentic allows you to open yourself to more, I mean, because people are more willing to share with you when they know you're authentic. So, and being compassionate, I think allows, uh, I mean, you know, it, it's really a very tough world out there. People are very polarized about a lot of things, but showing compassion is a very, uh, it's a universal value, uh, I think, and it transcends borders, boundaries. So, you know, even small things like saying thank you, I think is important. Mm. So, and that's something that I, I truly stuck, has, has truly stuck with us and it's something that uh, embodies really pretty much uh, even within our business. Mm. So, uh, every staff that comes on board or, you know, whoever comes on board must embrace this. So, this mm. is a very, very critical key uh, value and belief system that uh, that we, we, we must have when dealing with customers and even in our personal life. How do I say you embody that? Like, like when you say you're very authentic, I'm like, yeah. I mean, there's no point, uh, you know, being fictitious mm. or because at the end of the day, people, you know, are going to, because there's, there's not, I mean, you, ca- you can't hold or maintain that kind of facade for a long time. Okay. At some point, people are going to see your true colours mm. and, you know, and that's, that's you know, yeah, that, that's, that's going to be your downfall essentially, right? Yes. Yeah, so I think just being true to who you are, I think you live better, you sleep better, you don't have to kind of, you know, put on a, a fake kind of persona every time you go out. I think that's the best way to live life. So, final yeah. thoughts. Um, could you share some words of advice for someone who's considering a career change from a field that's completely different to, you know, what they were doing? Mm. So, I think uh, I'll maybe offer three different areas. Uh, so, first, I think it's finding a niche. Uh, I, tell, I tell people all the time that, you know, uh, finding a niche is important. Uh, people nowadays tend to want to consult whether it's a service type business or even uh, you know, other kinds of business, uh, you must be known for something. You don't want to be known just like the, you know, the vet that does everything or the rehab center that does everything. You know, There must be something that sticks. Mm. You know, in our case, um, Fido's Purpose is uh, widely known uh, within within the, the place that we operate in uh, as, as to be uh, one that is very, very focused on exercise-based uh, canine rehabilitation. Mm. So that's something that no other practice has so far been able to emulate. And, uh, you know, whilst we may not be able to, you know, accommodate to maybe certain classes of uh, dogs that may come in with more complex problems, but you know what, that's okay. We don't endeavour to try to cure every single problem. We, we, we acknowledge that, but we just focus on truly our craft. We hone our craft very clearly and uh, we continue to grow in our area. So I think finding that niche and what works for you is, is going to be very, very important for the, for the person that's listening to this. So that's just really the first step. Mm, the second step, uh, I would say, is really just open yourself to opportunities. Just be humble. I think, you know, most times, I think if people are humble, I think uh, people are willing to share. You know, uh, and you know, you can you can really gain a lot from the snippets from the everyday person. Uh, like for me, uh, personally, uh, I you know ask a lot of people different things. Like you know, when I ask people like you know, what do you do in your jobs? It's not because I want to really find out about your background. It's not because I want to you know be a when when do CFI. You know what you do. What 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 what's your income level like? You know, it's not so much that, but it allows me to you know really try to seek advice from different people. Mm. Like we've got clients that you know who are lawyers by training, some are teachers, and you know we we ask them, oh, then how do you deal with say uh, complex problems in, in in school where kids don't listen to you? And you know sometimes they give us very good feedback, like you say, you know try to find uh try to find their soft spot. You know some of them may have very very difficult family backgrounds, and then you know uh, trying to feel that you are there for them. Oh, that's some new advice that we've never heard before. Okay, mm-hmm. so then how do I then use the same advice in my own practice? It may mean, you know, comforting clients when they are a little bit upset. You know, some clients are a bit more brash. How do you then, you know, yeah. So I think, so you realise all these things do come together, even though it may not be directly relevant, but it's something you can then, you know, try to massage <laughs> a little bit and then, you know, put it together in your own di- different context. Mm. And uh, three, I think it's just really courage. 
I think uh, uh, courage is very important. I think you can have all the kind of um, qualities, you know, to be successful. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you lack the courage, then I think then you won't go far. Uh, I think it's really all about just trying to put aside your own uh, I'll say differences, it's more about you can acknowledge your own weak points, you can acknowledge your own areas of improvement, but I think also knowing that, you know, um, rather than just being fixated at about her, maybe I cannot do this well, you know, but just really say, hey, you know, let's just work on it, action on it. So the action is the important part. Don't let all that kind of uh, uh, what if, what if, you know, kind of hold you back. So when you realize when you start actioning on one item, everything kind of flows a bit better. You develop your own confidence. And then you realize that, hey, you know, actually it's not that bad after all. And then, you know, one thing leads to the other. And then you realize by the end of maybe a certain timeline that you had in mind, you have actually grown so much. Mm. So, so yeah. So if you do these three things consistently, and I think the word is consistent. Yeah. Um, consistent uh, consistency. And uh, then most most times people are generally able to be successful. And I mean, successful by the, doesn't guarantee you to, you know, doesn't guarantee a person to be, say, a millionaire or, or that. But, but respective to your own uh, so-called... Uh, beliefs and your own desires yeah i think most people should be able, able to achieve what they want to achieve mm, thank you i think yeah. that was very yeah uh what's the word very like wise <laughs> well yeah i mean uh, i've been known to be an old soul so 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 that's absolutely uh, within my within my you know yeah my space yeah yeah thank you so much for mm. for sharing all that um so if if I guess our listeners want to know more about you or find out more about Fido's Porpoise, mm -hmm. where should they, uh, where can they find you? Right. So uh, yeah, they can find us on Instagram uh, at Fido's Porpoise. Uh, there's also a website, but that's something that's been currently redeveloped. Uh, so I think we have we've kind of just uh, grown the team. We've kind of covered. Um, we are increasing more uh, service differentials uh, on there. So that's going to be worked out at some point. But www.fidosporpoise.com. Uh, and yeah, pretty much we are on Facebook, but we are quite uh, inactive there. But I think these two channels are typically where you will find us. Uh, WhatsApp us if you like. Uh, then uh, we can also get to your questions. No obligations. And like say, uh, you know, if any time you want to arrange a consult, we'll be there to help you as well. And uh, yeah, like I say, I'm hoping to see how we can do more together as well. I think this is, this has been a really great conversation. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for taking the time to come down today to have this conversation. Also, uh, I've learned a lot also. And yeah, I, I I will see you soon with one of the dogs. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And you never know, uh, there could be more uh, collaborations in the works. Huh? Yeah, so so yeah, just stay tuned. Uh, happy. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me.